Hello, everybody. Happy Tuesday. It's Okta Day. And the question is, is crypto dead? Of course it's not, but that's the story today. So thank you all for being here. Let me make sure I got volume today. I do, which is also excellent. And a shout out to Zeno for being out there. Thank you so much. <laughs> what, a, what a good time to be alive. So as usual, it's Okta. It's Tuesday. We're going to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly of crypto. And uh, Bitcoin just hit 28K. Woohoo! Back again. And uh, Google just hit $110 briefly, too, after some good earnings. We'll talk more about that and how it all weaves together into crypto and Web3. Maybe to prove it is dead or it isn't. We shall see. And of course, now this is investment advice. And uh, if you are short on time, by the way, uh, we have now a Substack. It's taking off quite well. If you don't have time to tune into YouTube each day, you can get video recaps sent to your email. It's only $45 a year. It is the cheapest and best Substack out there. And that's more than 300 emails. Uh, there is about 10 to 16 hours of research from multiple people into every single video. So that means 260 hours of research is summarized for you. And all proceeds go to the community writer and his son, who is 12, and he buys Tesla stock, which is kind of a cool story. It makes me so happy. Let's talk about the ugly first. Normally, I start with the good, but today it's ugly. So buckle in, ladies and gentlemen. And a big thank you to T and Lee out there in the chat too, and K8 and everybody is helping. First of all, crypto market last week. This was taken, this snapshot was taken right before Bitcoin shot to 28K. So apologies for that. But still, uh, what is important to note is very little, there's no dark green with the exception of Tron, which is bizarre for the last week priced in Bitcoin. ETH down 5.5%. Again, these numbers change by the minute. Everything else is down. And Bitcoin was back at the heavyweight position. In terms of dollars, you can see here, even Bitcoin was down 6.4%. Of course, we came off the 30K last week and fell down. Bitcoin dominance 45.34, depending on how you measure it. If you go to trading view, it'll say 47.3%. And it all depends what you take into account. But a lot of dark red, which is not good. Pink for Binance and Tron, the rest. Darker red, which is not good at all. So it has been a little bit of an ugly week, but you know, Bitcoin moves fast. Looking at the real time price right now. Just hit that 28K and it's now 20, 20 let me get this right. 27,970, 30 bucks away from that magical 28K. And remember how long we struggled with the 28.6 level? That could happen again, but we'll see. Thank you, MT. So let's talk about the story today. Crypto is dead. Um, obviously, uh, I a lot of people listen to the All In podcast and Shamath came out and said, crypto is dead in the United States. No ifs, ands, or buts. Hmm. Let's analyze that. Let's dig into some of the data points about what this all means and maybe a little bit into Shamath himself. So crypto is dead in America, tech billionaire Shamath Palapitaya said. And uh, I added two slides here, not only that article, which isn't really worth reading, but what is important is the chart I added on the side, the top 25 crypto VCs by fund size in 2023 on planet Earth. 19 of the top 25 are all American and all alive and well. So maybe it's not dead or else these funds wouldn't be there. In fact, looking at some of these funds, some of them have huge amounts under management, nearly 8 billion under A16Z, 7.5 billion under Binance, Multicoin, nearly 3 billion. Again, big, 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 big heavy hitters out there. So I don't think crypto's dead, but let's look at some more data points. Uh, sometimes people make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. Uh, least of which myself. But if I was an investor and these were my records, uh, I'd be pretty upset. So uh, I like to strike for 80% win rate, at least 70%, and definitely more than 50%. But if you look at all of Shamath's SPAC returns that I analyzed here for you, so you don't have to, uh, you can see that of the 18, only one won. And that was MP Materials, which was the beneficiary of things like battery technology and electrification. Everything else down. The average loss for all of these 18 SPACs is over 26%, which is ugly. So again, nobody's perfect. Shamath is a very, very smart guy. The SPAC thing didn't work out. And maybe he's wrong about crypto too. 
we'll see. But remember, quick spack reminder, this is a funny little thing on, uh, I think it's the inverse Shamath on Twitter. But it says, losing your life savings in five weeks investing in SPACs, but losing your life savings in five seconds with ODTE options, different. By the way, an ODTT option is a zero date to expiration option that expires the same day it is traded. So talk about playing with fire. Playing with options is playing with fire. I play with options all the time. <laughs> but zero days to expiration options, uh, you're jumping on a hand grenade. So be very careful out there, ladies and gentlemen. Let's look at some more data points as well. Google in the news right now because their earnings were a little bit better than expected. In fact, let me talk about the earnings real quick. It just came out right before I went live, but Google Cloud turned profitable apparently for the first time on record with an operating income of about 200 million on about seven and a half billion in revenue. So not only is it growing fast, but a year ago it was only five billion in revenue. So it's growing really, really quick and it lost nearly a billion dollars. So good job there. In fact, uh, Thomas Kurian runs that organization at Google. And uh, interesting guy, very smart guy, memory like an elephant, never forgets anything. And I know because I've met him a couple of times. Anyway, crypto is dead, but 13% of Americans use it. 4% of the world has a digital wallet and there is continued increase in education. That's why I make these videos. And more and more people are becoming aware of cryptocurrency and how it works. And this is in part due to crypto in the media, crypto in the newspapers, people talking about crypto in taxis. And there, especially with the recent banking crisis, everybody is now jumping in. Also, other things that have happened recently, crypto has gotten a lot better. DeFi has gotten a lot better, more user-friendly. There's more acceptance, of course, as well by merchants around the world. For crypto, you can buy anything you want with it. And user experience, I always focus on that. It's so, so critical for many people out there. And what's also cool is, well, the reason I shared this little picture is Google launched an accelerator for blockchain companies. Okay, I know this is in the ugly news, but I'm trying to defend the ugly news with good news. Technically, shouldn't be here. Let's look at some Bitcoin adoption from the top and bottom model. You can see here, since 2019, we went from 21 million Bitcoin users up to 46 million today, up a mere 220% since 2019. Still going up. And wait, wait, wait till the bull market begins, then it's going to be insane too. Um, and I'll come back to Google in a second after in the good news, because there's more good news coming from that perspective. But back to the ugly, it is dumpage time. Who wants to be dumped on? Raise your hands, please. These are the big unlocks, or what I call dumpage, over the next 13 days. All of these tokens as well pretty much have terrible compendium scores, with the exception of Cosmos. Um, but anyway, the dumpage is bad. Let's look at some of these numbers. You can see Ronin here, top of the cards, a couple of 15 million or something. Um, Nin, Stepin, Cosmos Hub, Akala, that we spoke of before, and also DYDX. Lots and lots of dumpage. Feel free to pause this, check out the numbers, and make sure you don't hold through the dumpage period because there will be price suppression. And that is not a good time to be holding these assets. Uh, let's talk about other stuff that's happened. A bit, it was big news today, all over the board. But there was a sharp sell-off in First Republic shares, causing alarm in Washington. <sighs> I've been talking about more banking shoes to fall for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, uh, nearly two months now since Silicon Valley Bank hit the wall and all the other stuff happened. It was obvious. And the slow bank run continues every single day. And there's more shoes to drop. First Republic have a problem now. Washington DC is scrambling. You got your Janet Yellens and the Jerome Powells and everybody trying to fix this with Joe Biden involved as well. And it comes as a big surprise to them, but not to us because we know better. In addition, let's look at the dollar. This is an interesting one too from the Daily Shot. This is the credit default swap on a one US one year sovereign bond. Okay, look where it's come from. From January, it was about 17 or 18 basis points. Now it's 140.46. Nothing to see here, folks. But really, just so you understand what this means, a CDS, a credit default swap spread of 140 means that the buyer of a CDS is willing to pay $140 for every $100 of underlying debt obligation. And this is a high CDS spread, and it indicates that investors are concerned about the risk 
of a U.S. sovereign default. Ooh, why, why could that be? Well, uh, let, let's start with some of the stuff we've been talking about as well for a long time. A weak economy. The Fed is hiking. They're waiting to smash jobs, more jobs, because they're looking at data from six months ago and don't understand the structural difference in the labor market. But they have 320 PhDs and I don't know what they do all day. They probably just trade crypto. In addition, huge government debt levels, which is just going to explode higher as deficits explode higher. You got political instability, a decline of the US dollar, and uh, so much more. Um, I don't know where my phone is, so I can't even turn it off. Anyway, it's normally off in airplane mode before I do these. But this is the cost of insuring the US dollar against default. And by the way, this is higher than the Chinese yuan. So the US now is a shittier currency based on the CDS than the Chinese currency. Think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry for using a bad word. I never do that. In addition, in Armageddon news, <laughs> because of FRC, which is First Republic, it is shaking the Fed up. Not Fed up, but shaking the Fed, Federal Reserve, up. And when you look at this chart here, you can see since the FRC worries hit today, by the way, the stock was stopped twice today. Intramarket is watching the chart. The market rate hike predictions currently are changing rapidly. It shot from 88% chance of a 25 base point in May to 70% chance right now. And the pause for two months, which was three months yesterday, is now eight weeks pausing. And then the first rate cut will be in October. It was November yesterday. Everything's coming ahead. It is a moving target. There are more shoes to fall. And P.S., if you want a banking update, I'm seeing a lot more cracks. If anybody's interested in that, I know it's mostly a crypto audience, but I do have a GRE coming, the Global Real Estate Update this week. But if you want to see some banking stuff too, it is fascinating. And it's important to learn as well of how broken the system is. It is stunning. And that's why it's an exciting time to be alive because we can see it all happening and unfolding before our very eyes. Now we're going to switch into the good news portion of the segment, which is awesome. Uh, let's talk about Balaji's bed, which technically is not good news, but... Uh, I thought it was kind of funny, you know, people knew it was not going to happen. Thank you, KN. But tracking his bet, you can see we are right here, which is, you know, between 27K and 28K. Obviously, we're not going to hit the $100,000 Bitcoin, which would be Apple's market cap, or the $500,000 Bitcoin, which would be gold's market cap, or the Bitcoin at a million dollars, which would be U.S. Treasury market, $24 trillion. However, what is kind of interesting is the market cap of Tesla is the same as the market cap of Bitcoin. To see the pattern here is kind of fascinating that the market cap is the same for both. Anyhow, everything is a moving target and both are drastically undervalued. Let me prove to you why. First of all, let's look at the bear market drawdown status and how much we have rebounded. And here you can see from this chart, you've got a couple of different colors. We have, I've got to zoom in to make sure I get this right. Oh my God, I can't hardly see. <laughs> um, let me see. Do, 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 do. Bear market of the first halving cycle is in green. The second halving cycle is in blue. And then the third is the orange is where we are today. Now, what's really interesting is the bottom of the first and third cycles lasted almost exactly the same time, 363 day, 365 days and 364 days, uncanny. And then the bottom at, at down to 85% was 411 days for the second halving cycle. But when you look at this, obviously we are, the simple way to look at this chart is the orange is way ahead of schedule, way ahead of blue, way ahead of green. And why is that? Well, I think, by the way, if you're asking why blue tanked, you know, that is the COVID crash that happened in the blue when it went up and then sideways and then down. Towards the end of 2019, there was a little bit of a financial crisis. And then, of course, in March 2020, there was a big pandemic crisis. So the rest is history. So that explains why this chart needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. But... So far, so very good. This is shaping up to be quite an exciting cycle because we are way ahead 
of where we were in the past. The question is, nothing goes straight up. Everything takes a breather. And this breather we're having right now is actually very fortuitous. And I'll explain why with this, a cup and handle, which is kind of an old TA thing, but it is kind of interesting to see how it does work here. So when we look at this, this is a chart from Swiss Block. This is not my work, but I share what I think is interesting and I agree with. So the current correction in Bitcoin is extremely bullish. And let me explain why. It's because of the structure of the correction. And this is the cup and handle. So with the little green teal, very crude drawing I have there, uh, you see the big bottom piece of the cup and the handle is on the right between one and two and up to where we are. So typically, the neckline of this pattern has been broken and it's common for the price to retest the neckline before moving higher. We spoke about this on DCA yesterday as well. And this retest is currently happening and the current wave two is developing in an extended flat, an extremely bullish sign. And it suggests that the move lower is coming to an end and Swiss block and to some extent myself, we believe we'll make a final push towards, well, 26.5, 27K, which we kind of had, but now it's rocking again. And this coincides with the final push higher in interest rates before a strong reversal lower. The minimum target for the cup and handle minimum is 35K and the maximum is 42K. And the target for wave three of the Elliott wave count of lower degrees is 42K. Or even if you have an extended version, it could go up to 52K, which would coincide with what the old patterns look like if they weren't interrupted by the pandemic and other such matters. So this is not a guarantee of future results but it is super interesting to watch. So for those cup and handle fans out there, enjoy. Uh, let's look at where we are today as well. More draw drawdowns because the way patterns repeat is uncanny and therefore we look at them. So here we have the 2011 bull. Again, it was very abbreviated. Not many people knew what Bitcoin was in 2011. So that's why it didn't go so crazy. Then we have uh, the Genesis move and kind of the pink. And of course, the 2015 to 2017 bull in blue. And look at how it went. Then again, just like I spoke about in the second previous chart, you have the big drop off after the run early 2019. And then it went flat because of the financial worries in the market, kind of like what we have today. And then we had March C19 hit. And that's that big dip in March 2020. After that, it was straight up and to the right. Here we are, just for perspective, ladies and gentlemen, the little black squiggle you can hardly see there with the red arrow pointing at it. That's where we are now. Anybody guess where we're going to go next? If history repeats from the last four cycles, the answer is up and to the right. So a good time, barring any unforeseen black swans, etc. And by the way, this is all happening with Fed hikes. Uh, looming recession, banking crisis. <laughs> I mean, all the stuff being thrown at it is still going up. So can you imagine if it was, you know, clean air? Be insane. Let's look at escape velocity as well. This is from Glassnode. And this is the Bitcoin supply and profit and loss ratio. And uh, we can see this uh, by taking the ratio between the supply and profit and the supply and loss. Now, the oscillator has achieved escape velocity this year. We had the duration of only 36 days in the pink. And this confirms the transition out of the bear market, which was a regime of loss dominance near cycle lows. And by the way, over the history of Bitcoin, this is the most interesting thing. We have only observed 415 of the last 4,639 trading days, or 9% have been down here in this pink zone. So if you did not buy in the pink, hey, it's hard to nail that 9% bottom. But history, the reason we look at history is it tells you exactly where things have come from, and where they're probably going to go next. No guarantees, but it is fascinating. Hey, Stephen, got some good news coming up for you too in a minute as well in your wheelhouse. Let's look at this other piece as well. This is the Supply Foundation. And uh, this is again related to supply and profit loss. But look at the divergence between the blue and the pink. 
the Bitcoin supply and plot profit is blue, which is up and to the right. And it's now uh, about 15 million of Bitcoin is in profit and about 4 million of Bitcoin is in loss. And this is a very strong, I can't stress this enough, an extremely strong opening to 2023. The aggregate market confidently trans transitioned out of the bear market, i.e. the regime of unrealized loss, all that pink. See the way the pink spiked and the way the pink crossed over the blue, which means the majority of holders were holding a bag that was losing or underwater towards one of unrealized profit. And the sharp divergence between supply held and profit versus loss is incredible. However, just to bear in mind here, the more the blue goes up away from the pink, the more incentive there is for people to sell. Except this time people are more knowledgeable and they know it's going to go a lot further. So the question I have is who is selling? Because the 10,000 plus whales are buying like hell. Every other cohort is flat or selling. These guys, the big guys are buying. So I think I covered that yesterday or the day before. I can't remember or put it on Twitter. Or I don't remember. Anyway, let's look at option action. Now I went out to September 29th because that is confluent with the Swiss block cup and handle the 42K target for September 29th. Now, what I always try and do is I try to find confluence and patterns in things. If you have two things saying the same thing or three things saying the same thing, the more confident you can be in the outcome. And this is the Deribit Bitcoin action for September 29, 2023. Now look at all the action at 40, 43, and 45K. Big, big bets up there. This is confluent with the Swiss block. Even people are betting on a 63K Bitcoin by September. And the put call ratio is 0 0.4. So vast majority of um, the purchases are calls. But that is very, 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 very bullish. I wish I saw the pricing for those uh, 60K call options. Now, it doesn't mean Bitcoin has to hit 60K for people to be profitable. As Bitcoin price rises, so does that call option. So I'll try to pick up the historical prices and dig into that. In addition, is it Bitcoin season? Woohoo! Yes, it is. Look at this. This is like a record uh, multi-year low for Bitcoin at eight. So last time it hit uh, 14 or 16. I think last week was 16 went and the week before was 14. So it went from 14 up to 16, right down to eight which is interesting. That means Bitcoin is outperforming the majority of the top 50 altcoins out there today. So fascinating to watch. In addition, in decoupling news, this is Bitcoin versus NASDAQ. And you can see NASDAQ is chasing up the rear here, uh, up over 16% over the last 90 days, while Bitcoin's only up 33%. Remember, year to date, Bitcoin's up about 77% so far, 78%, depending on how far this puppy is moving. And let's check. It's right there, still hanging at 28K, but it was a nice big leg so far today. So that is the decoupling news. And fear and greed, as we can see here, is holding steady. So we did have a little bit of a dip last week that I covered on the 20th, uh, whatever it was. We fell down from, I think it was 17th of April, fell down from the 70 mark down to about 52, 53. But we're still greedy and holding on. And I think if this line was to fall under the 50 mark, maybe a little bit of cause for concern. It may be a cause that the market is losing confidence, but it's holding tight, which is a, another good sign too. In addition, let's talk about Ethereum for a second. This is from K33, and Ether has retraced some of its upside following the initial post Shanghai strength. And it's currently trading about 0 0.066, I think, or 0 0.067 versus Bitcoin, down from 0 0.071 last Tuesday. I had that beautiful spike. This is also represented. What you're looking at here is the option action. This is the Ether CME open interest. You can see it's spiked up to 317,000 ETH, and it's now fallen back to 207,000, which is less than where it was before the run for Chappella. Now, either open interest has fully retraced from past week because everybody is kind of not freaking out anymore. There hasn't been a huge amount of drainage um, that people thought would happen. 
And uh, we also see roughly a weekly growth of 44% following Shanghai. And this growth was very short-lived and the CME's open interest fully retraced. Uh, in fact, it's lower than that pre-Shanghai. So Ether futures fell rapidly, which is okay, not bad news. And other news as well, which took a lot of people by surprise. There was huge concerns over a massive exodus of staked Ethereum following the Chappelle upgrade, and they've been quashed completely. Token Unlocks is reporting that a total of 1.66 million ETH was withdrawn since April 12th, but 1.1 million has been deposited. That's the green spike there that you see, which is almost totally offsetting the withdrawals. And that means it is signaling that there is still an appetite to stake ETH. It's a good thing. People know where it's going. And people, if they have 32 ETH lying around, they're locking it away and they will be getting good returns. But there is some bad news regarding Ethereum as well. The meme tokens are killing ETH. And Ethereum has been struggling to scale and reduce gas fees, I think, since 2017. Anybody remember CryptoKitties craze? That caused major congestion on the Ethereum network and led to very high gas fees. And since then, Ethereum has made some progress in scaling and tons of new layer twos, but it's still far from being able to handle the level of demand that it sees today. And recently, a handful of meme coins caused even more congestion and led to high gas fees once again. And this is just not sustainable for it to scale. So there was uh, old coins like Troll, Aped, Bobo, and a whole bunch of others. The big marks are churning up all of the gas fees, and this is not acceptable for mainstream adoption. People wanna know what they're gonna pay, when they're gonna pay it, no matter how busy the chain is. And this is a, an issue. In addition, this is uh, an interesting piece. Bitcoin ordinals are on fire and Blur is bombing. Blur is the biggest NFT platform on Ethereum. And this is, I think, with uh, Bitcoin ordinals, about $76 million worth have been traded so far at current prices. And more than $5 million has been paid to miners and fees so far uh, for these 1.6 million inscriptions. You can calculate the average cost. 1.6 million inscriptions, $76 million in value. Anybody calculate what that is in value on average per ordinal? Drop in a comment below. I'm going to always test you every day. But the ETH NFT market has been bolstered by a significant volume of blur, which has actually almost disappeared. And this goes back to what I always say is crypto is fickle. People aren't loyal to platforms. They'll move around wherever the current trend is, wherever the cheapest price is, wherever the best NFT is. And this is reflected here too in how quick things can move um, here you can see Ethereum is still a 800 pound gorilla, but it's down in terms of transactions by 23%. Uh, Solana is down less by 10% in terms of transactions, sales down higher. Um, but Immutable X is there too, but up in terms of number of buyers. Cardano, Car this is super interesting. Cardano at $400,000 in sales has leapfrogged. They're 10x higher than Polygon right now in NFT sales. And this is a complete reversal to what it was like a month ago. Last time I looked at this, you got Algorand and others kind of doing nothing. But again, everything goes to the two or three big black holes and that's where all the action will always be. But Matic, it was like somebody turned off the chain. So we have to figure out what's happening with Matic. Uh, oh, by the way, this shows that paying to play, as I say, never ever works. They bought what they believed were successful NFT programs or collections from Solana. <laughs> now nobody cares anymore. So don't pay to play ever, ladies and gentlemen. And in terms of Solana NFTs, they are topping Ethereum top names. There's new collections called Mad Lads, which means I think Crazy Boys. Uh, sales are nearly 2.5 million, up nearly 30%. And Oogie NFT, I guess this is some type of other mutant board program, nearly a million dollars in sales, up 800%. And Board Ape Yacht Club, down 66%, which is a massive dip. Same with Mutant Ape. And uh, I think they need to get a little bit more creative with their naming conventions. Board, mutants. And... Anyway, enough of that. I like Mad Lads, so I need to find out what it's all about. In addition, I did mention I come back to Google after their kind of better than expected earnings results. 
But Google is now partnering with Solana for Web3. Also, they're partnering with Alchemy and Nansen and a new number of other players. So again, going back to the whole thesis that crypto is dead, if it was, why would Google be partnering with all the top players in the space? Ta-da! And they're integrating it into their Google Cloud platform as well. So let's talk about uh, Solana Q1 report. There's a very cool Q1 report from Step. And uh, normally, I think uh, Nasari do one as well. But there's a lot going on, and it goes so far beyond NFTs. And the real story is D-Pin. I've been mentioning it a couple of times. But the D-Pin narrative is really gaining momentum. More projects are consolidating onto the Solana blockchain, or they're beginning to migrate to the network, or they have already migrated, or they're cons considering it right now. So we have already Helium, Hive Map Mapper, Render, and others uh, among the projects that are considering the move to Solana. Um, Helium has already moved. Uh, Render is moving. Hive Mapper has moved as well, but there's others that are considering to move as well. So this could become huge. Can you imagine the amount of transactions and daily active users? This is the black hole that I've been talking about for years. It's happening right before our eyes. And it goes way beyond um, successful NFT projects. Also, DeFi uh, is growing on Solana rapidly again, despite the FUD that's been there. Solana continues to persevere. And they also had the hackathon, the Solana Grizzlython, which saw overwhelming response, over 10,000 applicants and 800 project submissions, and a couple of very good sponsorships as well. So again, the Solana community, technology, blockchain is here to stay. Otherwise, these projects wouldn't migrate to it. Imagine that wouldn't be a very clever strategic uh, decision for some of these big names, especially like Render. By the way, a lot of people have been asked me to do a, should I buy a Render? Let me know if you want me to do one of those. Um, I haven't done one in a while, but I will do that for you guys if you want to. In addition, daily active users are moving around rapidly. This thing changes from day to day. And here we have the new number one, despite the fall off in NFT action, Polygon has the highest number of daily active users as of yesterday, 319,587. Solana's number two at 280,619. And ETH, number three, 278,000. Arbitrum is now 268. Arbitrum were the winner just a couple of days ago. And it shows you how fast the space moves. And sometimes there is high activity because people are moving off a chain or getting rid of stuff to move to another NFT collection or whatever. So watch these numbers carefully. They change. And that's why I like to look at the seven-day moving average as well for much of this data. Let's look at money flows for a second. Uh, here we see Bitcoin had $53 million of outflows, but Ethereum had nearly 17 million come in last week. And this suggests that investors are becoming more confident in the cryptocurrency following the successful implementation of Chappelle upgrade. Remember I said, uh, the, <laughs> but you, when you find confluence between multiple data points, this supports the one I showed where people are still staking ETH and it's nearly offsetting the amount of withdrawals. Um, the, also, all of the inflows for Ethereum came from Europe. So Team Europe is investing heavily in ETH, which is interesting. Polygon also saw inflows of a million dollars. Uh, Solana saw inflows of $700,000. Litecoin, 200 grand. And of course, some people are still shorting Bitcoin. And that could cause a bit of a squeeze later today if Bitcoin continues on the rampage upwards. So let's look at developer activity. We look at all the stuff. TVLs, daily active users, uh, developers, etc. I would say follow the developers, follow the money. This is the latest statistic. You can see the number one play is still Ethereum. Number two is Polkadot. And number three is Solana. And number four is Cosmos. Uh, and then it goes down the line. You can see for yourself. But it's interesting to see the stark difference in the amount of developer activity between things like Matic that have a high number of users and other names there as well. So you can see for yourself. And this is verified through multiple sources and put into the IA engine. So this is not cooked, completely objective data. And also, just to remind you, sometimes the amount of developer activity does not necessarily reflect price action. Remember that too. So when you look at Polkadot here, number two, it's not reflected in price. But maybe the day will come where it is. We shall see. 
Um, let's talk about Tesla news for a second. Again, as you know, I think the two biggest asymmetric bets of the next decade are both Tesla and Bitcoin. And that's why I mentioned Tesla. But the Tesla has been on a price war, cutting prices on its electric vehicles in the US and abroad. And this has led to price wars with automakers such as Ford and Renault. And some analysts believe that Tesla price cuts could force other automakers to slow down their investment in EVs. Talk about a disaster. You've got somebody coming for your ICE business. They are. They've got enough margin to play with and bring the price way, way, way below average car prices, whether it's ICE or electric or other. And this is shocking. And for that report to come out and say other car makers are just going to hit the pause button on the electrification of vehicles, which is the only way forward, just shows you the pricing power that Tesla has, which is something. And I don't know, so even Tesla or uh, Elon Musk tweeted today said a few people understand what they're doing, which is kind of hilarious. But that's good because it's an opportunity for us to stack. In addition, this is March 2023 data. Um, Tesla Model Y became the most popular car in the United Kingdom for a team UK out there. They are outselling combustion engine SUVs, including Nissan Juke and Kia Sportage. And the demand for EVs is increasing rapidly in the UK. 800,000 BEVs are now cruising across the country roads. But people are worried in the UK now that the current charging network is struggling to keep up with demand. And here, what's very, very important is to look at the pace of charging, because a huge value add that Tesla has with their superchargers is the speed at which they can charge. You can see the light green is 100 kilowatt plus chargers and the dark green is 50 to 100. So you want the fast chargers. You can't afford to sit for hours to wait for your car to charge. You want to do it in 20 minutes um, at a Tesla charger. Enough time for a coffee and a bathroom break. So that's what's happening in UK and they're concerned, but they are going to build out infrastructure and be ahead of everybody else. And a lot of people have said, well, BYD is a bigger uh, EV car maker. Well, this chart, nope, says it's not. Remember, um, BYD make a lot of plug-in hybrids and hybrid cars, not pure battery cars. The battery leader on earth is Tesla. No ifs, ands, or buts. And if you wanna see the growth between the past and where they're going today, it's very clear from the chart as well. They are just accelerating as they ramp two massive gigas and they're building a new one in Mexico too. <laughs> the future is beyond bright. That's why I'm so excited every day to be here. In addition, let's talk about the dollar index because that does impact risk assets, including Bitcoin. So getting back to macro, again, another cool chart that tries to predict based on Elliott waves where the dollar index will go. And you know that the dollar index did bounce 0.14% last week, but we think it's just a temporary rally. This ABC structure, which you can build out in your trading view very easily, needs to play out and bearish sentiment needs to cool before the dollar index can turn lower. So we might get a spike back up to 105 to 107, back to the target, and then a decline. And again, talk about more confluence, ladies and gentlemen. Look where that decline is going down to September 2023. What did we talk about so far for September 2023? Drop a comment below. That is where a certain asset that we're very interested in could go high. But when the Dixie falls, risk assets rise, and we like risk assets. In addition, some more good news regarding, uh, well, disinflation is not necessarily good news, but a falling inflation is. And there's a ton of deflationary pressure falling um, driven primarily by the falling money supply. And we've seen durables turn year over year negative. So let's look at this chart here. You got your M2 money supply a little bit under the baseline, but it's gonna peak up again real soon. Durables are under, which means they're deflationary so far. Non-durables are tanking like a rock, which means they will soon be deflationary too. And core services is the last penny to drop. And once that does, boom, all games are off. Based on this, it's pretty clear with all the stuff that's happening and the amount of destruction the Fed is bringing about, we will be under 2% pretty soon. I don't know if it's going to be September. Wow, imagine if everything happens in September. It could be a stunning month and September is normally the worst month for crypto. But maybe this time is different. So we'll see. In addition, some other good news. U.S. college fees are falling for the first time in 30 years. 
Now, this is for private, nonprofit, four year institutions, also public four year colleges. Fees are dropping too, but for people to be spending $50,000 a year in a four year program with food and board and everything else is very expensive. But why? Why are the fees dropping? I think it's because of a number of reasons. First of all, enrollments are declining because people like me saying, hey, you can learn faster and quicker online than you can in a college that has a syllabus from 20 years ago. Um, and also rising costs of college, who can afford that? What's the point in pumping a quarter million dollars into education where you could buy Bitcoin and have your student set up their own business or something? And also there's growing popularity in trade schools too. Apparently, a lot of people are learning hard skills that can generate just as much money as other industries like programming or law, etc. And the I think because enrollments are declining, the colleges are forced to lower their fees to attract more students. They're cutting prices, kind of like Tesla. Uh, there's also increased competition because people can now learn in other places. And uh, who knows? I think as well. Not only has the labor market structurally changed since C-19 hit, but also so has the view towards education in general as well. So interesting times ahead for those guys. Now, final segment, the bad news. Let's jump in. Uh, first of all, digital asset fund flows down. And you can see we did have that big dip in Bitcoin. The outflows began before 14th of April when Bitcoin reached the very psychological value of $30,000. Some people took profit and that's what happens. If you jump into an asset, you make a quick buck, take some off the table and that's reflected here. It'll be interesting to see what happens next year. In addition, equities over the last seven days have been pretty rough with some of the big tech names. In fact, Google is a lot greener today right now since the earnings report, but this was taken uh, an hour or two ago. Amazon green for the week, uh, pharma green as well. I wonder why, but some of the other big tech names are down, uh, like Nvidia, Microsoft, Apple, etc. for the whole week. So all in all, not perfect, but not that bad either. And you can see how quickly things rebound. So with that, everybody, um, hit the like. A lot of work goes into these things. And Bitcoin, yes, 28,150. Things are shooting up and things are great. And I want to thank you all for being here. 2,000 people watching, 500 likes. That means one in four of you are hitting the like, but I appreciate you all. Thank you all for everything you do, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye all, and thank you to the mods in the chats and everybody else.